you're live. Hello and welcome. Um, we're a little late. We're having some technical issues. And with luck, all of us will be here on screen uh, before the hour is over. Uh, first, I want to say a huge thank you to Books and Books in Miami for hosting this event today on Crowdcast. Thank you to the visionary owner of Books and Books, Mitchell Kaplan, and to Christina Nosti of Books and Books for her work with us yesterday and today, and to the great staff there. And thank all of you for being with us. I'm Peter Balakian, founding member and steering committee member of Writers for Democratic Action. I'm a poet, nonfiction writer, and literary scholar. And I've also written about human rights in Turkey, especially the history of the genocide of the Armenians in Ottoman Turkey in the first part of the 20th century. It's an honor to work with my fellow WDA writers month in and month out. And let me say a few things about Writers for Democratic Action first. WDA is an organization of writers worldwide with a membership of over 3,000. And I urge all of you, anyone out there who wants to join, just to go to our website uh, and join. We're a volunteer organization devoted to working for democracy and especially in the US where our own democracy is under attack in the wake of political violence an attempted coup d'etat by a former president, endless conspiracy theory campaigns, assaults on the rights of women, people of color, the LGBT community and so on. We at WDA believe in literature as a bedrock of democratic culture and literary language as a force of humanistic inquiry and cultural cohesion. Some of our recent webinars have included conversations with Congressman Jamie Raskin, writer Margaret Atwood, poets from Ukraine. Writers for Democratic Action has generated getting out the vote campaigns during the fall of 20, 2020 and 2022. We're focused now on fighting book banning. We work at connecting citizens to their bookstores and libraries, and we host educational webinars each month that focus on national and international issues that pertain to democracy here and around the world. Today, our focus is on Turkey. Especially since it joined NATO in 1952, Turkey has been a unique force in the order of Europe the Middle East and the former Soviet Union. Turkey's struggles with democratic norms and institutions have large impacts on its society and on the geopolitical zones it impacts, including NATO, the Middle East, Transcaucasia, Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia. A secular Islamic society with a parliament, Turkey has afforded one kind of model to other countries in the Middle East. Yet its own authoritarian structures have often thwarted that evolution. Its human rights crimes have created footprints across the globe from the eradications of the historic Christian minority communities of Turkey, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks in the early 20th century to the current oppression of its large Kurdish minority today. Since the 2016 attempted coup, President Erdogan's crackdown on civil society has resulted in the imprisonment of much of the intellectual, academic, and progressive communities in Turkey. Where is Turkey now as it faces an election on the eve of its own centennial? What has the impact of the earthquake been on politics? Can Turkey play a role in Russia's war on Ukraine? What might its future hold? I'm honored to host three distinguished scholars today in conversation. Hulya Adak is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and Gender Studies at Sabanchi University in Istanbul and Director of the Gender Studies Center there and Visiting Professor at the Free University of Berlin. Her books include Mapping Gender, What's New and What's Ahead in Ottoman and Turkish Studies with Richard Whitman, and Critical Perspectives on Genocide, History, Politics, and Aesthetics of 1915 with Muge Gojuk and Ron Suni. 
Cevat Dardin was born in Tuncelli in the Dersim region of Turkey and educated in Istanbul. He holds a PhD from Princeton University and is a Manugian postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan, where he's affiliated with the Department of History and the Center for Armenian Studies. He's working on a book tentatively titled Preparing for Genocide Inside Four Mountains, Radicalization, Violence, and Environment in the Kurdish Province of Dersim. Fatma Muge Gojak, and she'll join us soon on, on screen, was born and raised and educated in Istanbul, received her PhD at Princeton University, and is professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her books include Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and the Collective Violence Against the Armenians, 1789-2009, the Transformation of Turkey, Redefining State and Society from the Ottoman Empire to the Modern Era, Rise of the Bourgeoisie, Demise of Empire, Ottoman Westernization and Social Change. I'm sorry that Ragib Zorakalu couldn't join us today. And I want to note that after our panelists' presentations, there will be time for question and answer session, and there is a Q&A bar on the webinar page, and I'll be fielding those questions. So again, thank you for being with us. And um, Julia, I, I'm going to put it to you to start. Okay. Great. Thank you, Peter, for that amazing introduction. Um, both very generous in your introduction of us, but also amazingly rich um particularly as it relates to the writers for democratic action i actually want to uh give a talk that's um that has resonances for my personal history but also as a as a sort of note to what i see to be the future in scholarly work and also in work that's engaged in reaching out to broader communities. Um, I'm just hearing echoes of my voice. Is that the case with you or can you hear me clearly? Hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Clearly. So uh, I'm also grateful to uh, my colleagues for making this panel passable and for making this lively exchange of ideas possible. So I'll start with a, a, um, a very hopeful year, 2015. So in 2015, we were able to hold the workshop on Armenian and Turkish scholarship. That's uh, basically a network that Müge Göçek and Ran Suni started all the way back in 2001 in Chicago. And it was a very closed workshop and many scholars came in to discuss uh, the Armenian genocide from different uh, disciplines and from different backgrounds and from different um, uh, nations, basically. So it was an international um, uh, network that continued over the years. And imagine in 2015, we were able to host this in Istanbul at Sabancı <laughs> University. This was a major breakthrough and the results of years of hard work by civil society initiatives, universities, individual scholars in Turkey, which opened up an important space for scholarship that allowed this brilliant conference to take place. And in fact, not just scholars, but activists, artists, film producers, writers, attended this amazing, lively exchange. We hope that the book that consists of the papers at that conference and subsequent meetings that uh, Watts gave rise to will be published under the title Critical Approaches to Genocide, the title that um, Peter uh, listed in his introduction. The possibility of organizing this workshop that focused on the Armenian genocide most significantly, while also looking at the violence against 
other populations of the Ottoman Empire in this time, including uh, other Christian groups, Assyrians, Greeks, was groundbreaking. It followed a series of scholarly and activist initiatives that started with a major conference on the Armenian genocide in Turkish, in Turkey, all the way back in 2005. So a decade earlier, Müge, myself, and many others, Ragup, were a part of this, again, groundbreaking conference that was held for the first time in Turkey in Turkish. Hence, the Watts Conference in 2015 marked the first decade and a half of AKP's rule and bespoke a hopeful period for academic freedoms in Turkey. Unfortunately, hopes were shattered in the matter of months. In 2016, as Peter told us so succinctly, a crackdown on academics for peace took place. This is an association of academics and scholars who support peaceful solutions to the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. Established in 2012, in about three years, uh, these academics, a thousand of them initially, signed a peace petition uh, under the title, We Will Not Be a Party to This Crime, critically addressing the violence in the Southeast and calling for peace. The numbers shortly increased to above 5,000 and internationally renowned uh, names such as Noam Chomsky uh, joined the Academics for Peace. Hundreds of signatories had to resign or were dismissed from their universities as a result of signing this petition. Dozens were arrested or had to go through investigations for years to come. Now, for their amazing commitment to peace and academic freedom, the Academics for Peace were awarded the 2016 Mesa Academic Freedom Award of the Middle East Studies Association and the 2018 Courage to Think Defender Award of the Scholars at Risk Association. Just shortly after this crackdown, in July 15 of 2016, um, a coup took place, which entailed further restrictions to academics and academics for peace. In 2017, so two years after the workshop in Istanbul, the Watts Network wanted to organize yet again. And this time we were bound to organize a conference, a very multidisciplinary one, including performance, film, uh, lots of uh, literature readings, etc., at the European Academy of Sciences in Berlin. And at that point, the conference got, unfortunately, the attention of Do Perinček, the chairman behind the left-wing party, Patriotic Party, and was attacked. Many of the Turkish scholars, including myself, could not attend, and the post-coup period posed a serious threat to, for instance, coming in and going out of Turkey, people's passports being confiscated. So this was a real uh, sort of challenge that um, uh, po was posed to the Watts Network and to our, our meetings. After this incident, many international scholars working in the field of genocide studies and the Armenian genocide in particular, stopped coming to Turkey for conferences and research projects. So this was a really unfortunate turning point. At the university level, it became more and more difficult to hold courses in genocide studies. When we talk about Turkey, we're not necessarily talking about a context in which uh, it, what you see in places like Germany, the Netherlands, the United States with institutes and centers of genocide and Holocaust studies, these do not exist. But individual and rigorous 
private universities particularly, but places like Boazici University as well, will host a number of courses, um, disciplinary foci, or will su help supervise theses and dissertations. Oh yeah, two minutes. Two in minutes. genocide studies. You have two minutes okay. to go, okay? I have, All to, right. I have to keep everyone at a 10 minute clip. So um, I wanted to talk about gender studies and the crackdown on gender studies as well, but unfortunately I will not have time. Suffice it to say that um, in the past few years, uh, we've seen a shrinking of gender and women's studies centers with centers names being changed to family studies. And uh, in the pandemic, unfortunately, when violence against women was increasing, um, some of these centers became rather dysfunctional. Now, just to connect to the last point about what we're going through right now with the earthquake, um, obviously it had devastating consequences um, and particular to, to universities at large. And recently, um, university students, especially from state universities, have been sent home and their dorms have been given to um, earthquake survivors. So imagine what that means oh, after the COVID pandemic, that we're going into another period of online education, what that means for solidarity building or the difficulties thereof. So we're going through a really um, second crisis, I would say, after COVID in terms of uh, networking, solidarity building and working on human rights. And in terms of redemption, my own personal story is now going toward storytelling and writing stories of this region. I think uh, this is what we can do globally to reach um, international audiences. Um, so that these silent voices and the difficulties of working on genocide and gender studies can be heard by international um, groups. Uh, I do want to continue, but for lack of time, I will leave the gender studies part for later. Thank you, Huya. And um, I, um, I mean, that's a marvelous kind of way into repression inside intellectual freedom and academic society. And uh, Javad is going to speak about minority rights in Turkey. And Muge, Muge, welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you on screen. Muge is going to talk about foreign policy and um, international issues. So Muge or Javad, whoever wants to take it next, minority rights or foreign policy. It seems that their microphone is stuck. So you know what? I'm going to bring you back in again, OK? And we should be able to hear you. Let's do that. Probably when he took off his headphones, when uh, Muge arrived. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear us now? Yes, good. Yes. Wonderful. So I'm taking on uh, and try, I'll try to put things more in context as well uh, after Hilya's amazing presentation of what the problems are and what can be done going forward in terms of storytelling as such. How did we get into this mess, you may ask? I think it's the 21st century that got us into this mess. Uh, uh, you know, in the 21st century, we were hoping there would be a positive change, especially in terms of Turkey's location in the world and uh, uh, unlike uh, the uh, sort of military custodianship that seems to be going on in Turkey until that point, uh, AK Party came to being and uh, from 2003 onwards uh, promised two things. Uh, one is to sort of join the European Union and the candidacy of that and the second one is to have uh, after Ahmed Davutoglu's vision zero uh, problem policies with all its neighbors. And uh, th there was also a widespread support for Erdogan, even though he was a religious conservative, because of his uh, EU stand of trying to go in there, unlike the other 
most uh, state-centric parties that didn't want to go in. So that is how he came uh, uh, to being, uh, taking a very Western liberal stand initially. Uh, and uh, from 2003 onwards, uh, what happened was with time though, unfortunately, uh, he didn't have the infrastructure. He couldn't create it, I think on the one side, and he didn't have the vision of where he wanted to go. Uh, on the other, and the vision he had, we found out later, was one that was very religious center, probably like a caliphate, where the state government differentiation it would no longer be there. And that is how I think we ended up with this autocratic system. Um, uh, what happened in terms of uh, foreign policy? Uh, well, we started with uh, zero problems, and then, of course, with time, I think as Erdogan sort of lost uh, control of, 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 of society and uh, of what was going on in society at, uh, as well, he became more and more violent uh, to control especially the opposition and uh, ended up, uh, therefore, with a lot of uh, punitive measures uh, within. Uh, the United, uh, within Turkey, but what happened outside is he, he became more and more hawkish, uh, in line, I think, with the Turkish military's vision of what's going on. As a consequence of that, if you look at what's happening, uh, the major problem, of course, is with Syria, uh, with the Syrian refugees, especially 8 million of them in Turkey, totally changes things. There is Rojava, uh, you know, Western Kurdistan, uh, you know, there is the possibility of a Kurdish state being established there, which is, of course, what not what uh, Erdogan in his very uh, sort of ethnic nationalist stand, religious nationalist stand, uh, does not want. Uh, when you look at Africa, uh, Erdogan sees Africa as a market, especially to uh, uh, market uh, his son-in-law's uh, Bayraktar drones, uh, so to speak. So we seem to be uh, involved at least in, in drone uh, uh, sales. Uh, and that also is the case in, in the Ukraine, uh, where uh, Erdogan on the one side uh, provided uh, by, uh, by Raktar uh, drones uh, to, to Ukraine. At the same time, uh, he renegotiated uh, a deal, a uh, crop deal with um, uh, Russia and the Ukraine, uh, so that they could um, export, uh, Ukraine could export uh, their crops. Uh, but on the other hand, when um, the Sweden and Finland wanted to join uh, NATO because of, of the problems, uh, obviously, uh, Russia was causing the imperialist sort of stand that Putin has. Uh, uh, of course, Turkey then uh, opposed this uh, alongside with Hungary uh, to, in a way, what happens is that Erdogan is trying to play, I would argue, uh, the United States and Russia against each other uh, to position uh, itself as a leading, at least, country in the Middle Eastern context. Uh, is he successful? Uh, well, the vision is there, but the strength isn't. Uh, that would only uh, work, I think, uh, if there were uh, true democracy in Turkey. There isn't. Uh, he's trying to do it through autocracy, and we know uh, through the work of Daron Ajemole and others that you cannot have democracy uh, without uh, having uh, full participation of all others. Uh, whereas what Erdogan has done instead is that he has totally stifled uh, the civil society, civil society as a whole, especially universities as such. He has stifled the judiciary by taking them all under his control. And uh, he has also uh, stifled, uh, of course, uh, politically uh, by establishing, uh, going from a parliamentary to a presidential system. He has also stifled communication by monopolizing all the media. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the economics uh, development, unfortunately, rather than investing in industrialization and manufacturing, which is the way to go forward, he has chosen uh, real estate development and construction, which also stifles uh, development. As a consequence of these measures and the uh, inflationary aftermath of uh, COVID uh, in general, Turkey uh, is in extremely uh, bad shape uh, financially, uh, where the, the Turkish lira has been devalued more than 50% in the last couple of years. And as a consequence, uh, 
we are in a very bizarre uh, uh, situation, I would say, internationally, uh, where uh, um, he, Erdogan seems to be playing sort of his last chips to get somewhere, but especially, I think, I agree with Julia, with this earthquake and the inadequacy of the state to do anything or to intervene before three days, uh, demonstrated to the people once again uh, that what he proposed, the presidential system, does not work in Turkey. Uh, the relations with everybody else in the in the world have been negative as a consequence. The only positive ones, uh, relations we have are with Africa or with sort of unequal relationships where Turkey seems to be in a position of power. But if you look at the rest of the world other than Africa, uh, I think uh, Turkey is unfortunately overplaying uh, its power and as a consequence has been uh, very marginalized in the Western context. And I'll stop there if that's okay. okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Muge. Should I just um, start, uh, Professor Valerie? Please go. Okay. Um, and, so first and of all, I'm to be part of about minority rights. Yes. 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 Uh, I'm uh, honored to be part of this conversation, and I would like to thank uh, everyone who have made this uh, possible. And I will be. Uh, I will try to briefly talk about uh, minorities, human rights issues. Uh, but mostly about the Kurds and Kurdish issue and why it is um, uh, critical, especially for uh, not for uh, democracy in general only, but also for the upcoming elections that are scheduled for May 14 of this year, uh, which is uh, really also has a symbolic event for uh, it is uh, the uh, centennial of the Republic of Turkey uh, since uh, 1923. Um, so, as as a uh, historian, I will uh, try to bring a little bit of a historical background to um, to, to uh, these uh, contemporary events that we have been uh, talking about. Uh, we and and the first thing to remember is that Turkey is uh, heir to Ottoman Empire uh, and it uh, inherited a, a diverse uh, uh, geography and and community. Uh, on which uh, it has built one of the most, uh, I would say, radical examples of nation uh, state over the course of this hundred years. Um, so uh, after the uh, basically largely uh, elimination of the Christian uh, Armenians and Greeks and other uh, non-Muslims from uh, once uh, cosmopolitan geography of Anatolia, there were two large communities that uh, uh, remained uh, as, uh, so to speak, problems for the formation of a homogeneous uh, nation state. And there were, they were uh, the Kurds, who are around um, uh, 20 to 25 percent of the country's population, which puts them at around 20 to 25 million. And that is around half of the Kurds uh, uh, overall. The other half of the Kurds are uh, spread across Iran, Iraq and, and Syria. And that's an important detail because uh, uh, whatever happens in regards to the Kurds in one part of uh, the greater uh, geography that's known as Kurdistan also impacts what is happening in the neighboring countries. And the other community was uh, is uh, the Alevis, uh, who are a religious uh, minority. Uh, and they are estimated to be around 10 to 15 percent of the total population, which also puts them uh, around uh, uh, I would say 10 uh, million, but these numbers are our estimates because uh, it is uh, for decades it has been outlawed to basically ask uh, uh, identity based questions in, in Turkey. So these are all estimated numbers uh, that uh, academics come uh, up with. So uh, there are two phases uh, that I will briefly mention in making these uh, questions relevant to today. One was right after the establishment of the Republic in 1923, there were a series of Kurdish uh, rebellions uh, because of the uh, lack of uh, recognition for any source of political autonomy for the Kurds, which was the case actually in, in the post-World War, uh, post-World War I uh, uh, severed treaty. And uh, those uh, uprisings uh, that started from 1925 in the Arbakir ended 
with a massacre, a large scale massacre in Dersim region in 1937-38. Now that Dersim region is significant for multiple reasons, which I will come back at the end of my uh, talk today. Uh, and then uh, basically after that massacre, the the Turkish uh, Prime Minister of the time came uh, made a speech in the parliament saying that the Kurdish question is no more, that, that they have solved the Kurdish problem. But as we uh, know today, uh, that was not the end of any problem, but the beginning, if anything, beginning of uh, uh, everything else that will come later. And Kurdish question basically uh, went underground uh, from uh, World War II up to uh, 1970s when uh, the PKK was uh, founded alongside some other Kurdish organizations in Iran, Iraq, and, and, and later in Syria. And then we have decades of conflict between the Kurdish militia and the Turkish armed forces until uh, early 2000s, uh, where uh, thousands of people uh, were died in, in both sides of the conflict. And then in 2003, Erdogan came to power and, and the new chapter was opened in the politics of the country. A small detail that I think is important is that he came to power with a 33% of uh, votes, but because of the election system in Turkey, he was able to uh, have 66% of the seats in the parliament. And that is largely because of the 10% threshold uh, that you, a party, need to have to, in order to be represented in the parliament. In that election that Erdogan came to power, 46% of the votes were not represented in the parliament. And that measure was largely put in place by the military coup in 1980 to prevent the pro-Kurdish and uh, what they call the, um, the jihadist or fundamentalist parties from entering into the Turkish parliament. And that turned out to be uh, the backfire, backfired basically um, and bring, by giving Erdogan uh, much more power than uh, it, he will normally get. And then uh, in from 2008 to 2000, uh, somewhere around 2013, there, were, there was this uh, period of uh, liberal policies in Turkey where uh, through processes or initiatives that are called Kurdish opening pro process, the Alevi process, uh, and also other uh, groups like the Roma, Greek, uh, Armenian Jews, there were all sorts of uh, so-called opening policies and the, and the liberal environment in the country. And then uh, uh, in, in 2013, actually, the uh, Erdogan's government started a peace process with the, uh, with the Kurds, uh, with the uh, PKK, basically. And uh, as part of the deal, the uh, militants, Kurdish militants will uh, withdraw from Turkey and uh, gather in uh, northern Iraq and then uh, until a, a more permanent solution will be found. But then things has changed in Syria and Kurds emerged as a, as a major political power in, in Syria. And that, I believe, has uh, changed a lot of political uh, calculations and dynamics within Turkey and, of course, in, in other parts of uh, uh, the Middle East where uh, Kurds, are, uh, uh, Kurds, Kurds live. So with that, uh, there was this moment of uh, what is called the Kobani mom moment, where a small city, uh, mostly a predominantly Kurdish populated city on the Syrian side uh, of the border uh, has came under a siege by ISIS and Turkey uh, blockaded any in external support to arrive in the city. And Kurds were uh, stuck uh, there and uh, basically uh, they were left to the mercy of ISIS. And that has compelled the international community led by the U.S. to uh, find a way to help uh, the Kurds there and uh, basically pushing back Turkey to allow uh, international support to arrive in the, in the region. And that basically started the process of the defeat of ISIS. And that also led to further uh, empowerment of the Kurds in, in Syria, um, uh, which also... Uh, at the same time, uh, triggered the collapse of peace processes uh, within Turkey. Uh, so there were those uh, uh, protests uh, during which uh, Kurdish uh, citizens of Turkey have protested against Erdogan, and Turkish police uh, basically uh, had uh, violently cracked down on them, uh, uh, killing 46 and uh, wounding around a thousand of them. And from then on, 
uh, this uh, basically violence, uh, basically the Turkish state's approach to Kurdish question has uh, uh, backtracked it back to uh, conflict area of 1990, 1990s. Uh, notably in uh, in 2015, uh, the pro-Kurdish HDP party uh, passed the 10% threshold, which uh, made it impossible for Erdogan to have a, a majority uh, to form a government in the in the uh, in the parliament, and that has turned all Erdogan's attention to suppressing legal uh, representation of the Kurdish demands in in Turkey, and he ended up uh, imprisoning uh, thousands of Kurdish politics, including notably. Uh, Selahattin Dem Demirtas, who was the co-president uh, of the uh, pro-Kurdish party, uh, and he's still in, in prison uh, since then. Uh, and finally, uh, today, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to the upcoming elections, there is a very interesting dynamic that is going on in the, in the country. In the last local elections in 2019, uh, the pro-Kurdish party decided to uh, support the opposition candidates in major cities such as Istanbul and Ankara and basically effectively helping the opposition win the mayorship of these two uh, cities. And that has become a major uh, challenge to Erdogan's uh, grip on, on Turkish uh, politics since then. And uh, currently, the uh, another significant detail is that uh, the uh, president of the main opposition Republican People Party, Kem uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, is from this uh, city that I just mentioned at the beginning, from Dersim. So he is uh, Alevi and Kurd, which bring together two uh, two questions in 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 his uh, personality, and that makes uh, him a very interesting candidate, especially in the centennial of the country um, uh, country's foundation. And the uh, pro-Kurdish HDP party decided to uh, unconditionally basically support his uh, candidacy. And that makes him a likely winner against uh, Erdogan if things uh, all goes as, as planned. Um, and in, in this debate about uh, the elections, even if not at the, uh, at the more, uh, I would say, uh, national level or at the media, uh, national media, uh, at the local level, Javad, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ten minutes. We're, uh, we, you, you have to conclude right now. One minute. Yes. Actually, I was just wrapping up my last sentence, okay. saying that um, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu, by bringing together both Alevi and Kurdish uh, identities, uh, is a, a controversial, but also a significant uh, figure, but also a significant uh, a litmus test for the democracy and opposition uh parties in in turkey yeah. okay great and i hate to have to be a timekeeper but we're, you know we, we have only limited space today but thank you all three of you um for opening up spaces of deep inquiry and uh significance as we try to think about turkey's role in its region and in its own society um, and the issues surrounding democracy and survival. I um, there there are questions out there, but I'd like to I'd like to throw out a question to all three of you uh, to start. The Economist reports that in 2008, Turkey had 88 percent agreement with EU policies. In 2016. Turkey had 44% agreement with EU policies. In 2022, 7% agreement with, US, with EU policies. This clearly indicates a major rupture between a vital NATO uh, member and Europe. Um, what, what can this amount to and I want to just focus on one thing. Recently, as an example, Sweden is applying for NATO admission, as we know, but Erdogan has refused to vote yes for Sweden's admission to NATO unless 
Sweden extradites a hundred people, Turkish citizens, their ethnicities may indeed be Kurdish, Alawi, and other, who are living, who have fled to Sweden in, in, in the face of Erdogan's crackdown and imprisonment of intellectual dissent. This seems to be such a dramatic example of Turkey's loggerhead with Europe. And it's dysfunctional, and I wonder what your take on it is and how you see a way of solving this problem, because it's really a significant problem. Uh, if I may go first, because of the foreign uh, aspect of it that uh, you're mentioning, uh, definitely there is a shift because I think of Erdogan's vision of where Turkey ought to stand in world uh, politics. And in that context, he sees himself as the sort of inheritor of the Ottoman Empire. He has a more imperial vision, but it's one that's also very nationalist. Uh, he tries to play, as I said, Russia against uh, the United States and weaponizes uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Turkey's ties uh, with Europe. And there are two things that are very important that he plays with. One is the NATO membership, of course, and that is how he is uh, trying to block uh, uh, Sweden uh, in a way, and before that, Finland, uh, to get some uh, uh, things, uh, concessions from uh, Europe. And unfortunately, Europe is beholden uh, to Turkey because of the eight, uh, eight, more than 8 million Syrian and other refugees that are trying very hard to come into uh, Europe. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Erdogan and Turkey is uh, acting as a gatekeeper, not letting these people uh, go in. And in return, uh, uh, EU has you know, paid uh, billions of dollars uh, uh, you know, for Turkey to keep these people in, in Turkey. So that is a very important uh, uh, bargaining chip, uh, and that maybe explains how these things change, uh, and it also explains the fact that in uh, uh, Erdogan's vision for the future, the future of Turkey does not lie uh, solely with the West, as it has been in the past, but also uh, with the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, and those are the, the ties that he seems to be uh, strengthening. Uh, but I don't think uh, it's going to be at least a decade or two as uh, before those links are strong enough to be able to stand withstand uh, the Western, uh, you know, power at the moment. And he doesn't seem to have seen that. And I'll leave there. I was going to make comments about that in the section on how uh, gender and women's studies have been meddled and muddled by uh, uh, this authoritarian regime. And uh, some of the progresses in that area are through the EU funded projects that universities have been getting. And I would like to emphasize two things I see as positive steps in the direction of uh, complying with EU standards and uh, moving towards um, uh, educational, uh, institutes of education that focus on human rights and women's rights and the rights of um, LGBTI plus. Um, uh, and, and there, I think monitoring and auditing of um, um, EU projects and especially gender equality at the university and institutional level is a must. And this is not happening. The second positive uh, that is happening right now is that the EU um, emphasizes having gender equality action plans and an institutionalization of anti-discrimination and gender equality at the university level as a must for any other EU project in any area. They could, this could be engineering, this could be economics, it doesn't matter. But without gender equality and without a focus on human rights and um, uh, laws and policies against um, harassment and violence, um, the universities that are bidding for EU funds will not be able to get projects in any area or uh, get funding in any area. I see that as a positive direction under this very authoritarian setting with, you know, um, 
lots of intervention into the universities and education system. Another um, site that I see as uh, indicative of what's happening in Turkey is, of course, Boğaziçi University. I'm sure you followed how um, since 2001, uh, the 2nd of January, when an appointed president uh, and rector was sent to um, uh, Boğaziçi University, faculty members have been protesting. So I think this kind of solidarity and protest is amazingly vital for us all as scholars and activists to be moving uh, more towards uh, values uh, set out uh, by the EU or compliance with EU standards. And I think uh, reaching out right now to international communities, I think we desperately need international solidarity and recognition. So more recognition for what's going on uh, during the Boazici protests, because those are not just against the appointed director, they're also for setting up standards for anti-discrimination uh, against faculty members who are working on minority or human rights, against against um, the LGBTI community of the university and also against women. I mean, they've closed down all women's clubs. They've closed down the LGBTI uh, student club and they've also uh, shut down the unit for sexual harassment and um, prevention of violence, gender-based violence, and have expropriated all the folders. So imagine what kind of a, a, a destruction this is. So it, at the university level, I see international solidarity and I see um, a lot of monitoring and um, sort of um, evaluation of already running EU um, projects and activities and research to be a must. Thank you. And Javad, did you want to respond? I just uh, briefly add, I basically uh, agree with uh, all the points of uh, Turkey uh, weaponizing its strategic position uh, against the West uh, and, 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 and basically using uh, Russia. And uh, in, when it comes to uh, the Kurds in, in this context, um, the Turkish invasion of northern Syria was also a part of this weaponization uh, in which uh, European powers, including the United States, basically did not stand against uh, Turkey's invasion, uh, knowing that actually that the only sole purpose was to crush the Kurdish political autonomy there. Mm -hmm. But they uh, did not uh, stand against this because Erdogan used uh, Syrian refugees in the country as a weapon against uh, EU, and he made this very clear. But despite that, uh, European countries went ahead with uh, with his demands, paying him uh, off to, to keep uh, refugees in, in Turkey. Uh, and uh, so I think um, Erdogan has used has learned to uh, use uh, his Turkey's geostrategic uh, position uh, both against uh, uh, Russia and against the West, and 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 in the meantime uh, suppress all. Uh, the Kurds, Alevis, uh, intellectuals, and uh, mm -hmm. other forces of democracy in, in, the, in the country. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to uh, ask a question from the audience. The question is, Muharim Inche, if I'm pronouncing it, I-N-C-E, has officially qualified for the ballot. What effect will this have on the first round and maybe this will allow all of you also to talk about the upcoming election and some of its possibilities. Uh, Muharrem Minja is a very uh, interesting case uh, uh, with respect to sort of where uh, it goes. People uh, compare him to Arab Makan's uh, son, who also has like uh, established the uh, Yeniden Refah Partisi. So there are, we have sort of uh, uh, Harem, it just is seen like the maverick in the left, or you know, and Erbakan's son is seen as the maverick of the right. And what happens though is, if you look at their voting potential, vote potential, it's supposed to be uh, very low. It's less than three percent. Uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, it's seen much more as sort of trying to deter, uh, take attention away from uh, sort of uh, the success that the opposition may be having going forward. Uh, people argue that ultimately both Inja and Arbakan are going to ask for some concessions and Arbakan did indeed, Fatih Arbakan join uh, the Jumhur coalition uh, basically uh, in return for probably some ministries and uh, a lot of uh, Congress people. Uh, 
Uh, likewise, they say in Germany also be going into uh, negotiations with Kılıçdaroğlu and get somewhere with it. If not, uh, uh, he it may he may be able to sort of uh, uh, reduce the the electoral uh, sort of potential uh, of uh, finishing off at this uh, Erdogan in the first round and uh, then moving on to the second round, which may advantage uh, Erdogan more. So. The opposition is trying to co-opt uh, Inge and uh, finish things in the first round because uh, 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 all the polls demonstrate that the opposition has more uh, votes at this point uh, than Erdogan and they want to sustain that. Thank you. Other responses to that question? Um, yeah, if I may, um, I think another an important detail about him is that he was uh, the opposition's candidate in the previous presidential elections. Uh, and uh, so that's an important detail that uh, we should keep in mind. Uh, until, uh, in, until these elections, he did not uh, uh, basically run uh, against Erdogan. And he they have united uh, uh, under uh, different candidates which have not uh, been successful in challenging Erdogan. So one of the uh, com comments or one of the, or, uh, I would say, uh, beliefs is that Kılıçdaroğlu, it's the first time that Kılıçdaroğlu thinks that uh, he has a chance to win against Erdogan, that Erdogan, Erdogan's power has uh, deteriorated so much that he has a real chance of winning the elections. And, uh, and so uh, Inge's candidacy uh, is largely uh, is, is an effort to prevent him from uh, uh, gaining the uh, winning the elections in the first round, and um, it is very clear that uh, Erdogan's uh, party is basically supporting uh, Inge and trying to make him more popular than he is through social media and uh, mass media. And uh, Inge uh, might must be aware of what is going on with his calculations, but he is still uh, uh, playing the game, and uh, we will uh, see how that is going to play out in the elections. It's an interesting detail in, in this election. Okay, thank you. And uh, as our time is coming to an end, I'm going to close with one more question from the audience, which is connected to this particular one. What are your thoughts on Kilicoglu's vow to send Syrian refugees back home. Oh boy, <laughs> that's a very difficult one uh, because there has been a lot of uh, problems with uh, how Syrian refugees have been uh, accepted in Turkey in the first place. Uh, their legal status is up in the air. Uh, they haven't been uh, treated as refugees, but they do not have, uh, you know, uh, the right to vote except uh, for those that have actually become uh, Turkish citizens, so to speak. But that's only, and correct me if I'm wrong, about 100,000 or so they think uh, out of 8 million. But then others are saying that uh, there may be a, a lot of uh, uh, corruption and uh, they may especially employ uh, the earthquake and all the people who have died there and uh, have Syrian refugees sort of vote in their stead uh, and do so voter corruption uh, as such. Uh, but with respect to where Kılıçdaroğlu will go with that, I think a lot will depend also on his negotiations with the European Union, uh, because obviously uh, uh, where they're going to go if he sends them back, uh, You'll have to negotiate uh, with, um, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, on the one uh, side Syria and and, and Putin, uh, and on the other side uh, with the EU, depending on where uh, to send the uh, Syrian refugees. So mm -hmm. I don't think uh, that is uh, very clear as to what he intends uh, to do with them. And whatever it is, it's not going to be. It will probably take a decade uh, to settle this. It's not going to happen in a year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people have already settled, of course, in different parts of Turkey. And they have also been impacted adversely by uh, the earthquake as well. Uh, uh, and that's another dimension of the problem. Anybody else want to respond to that or no? 
I just, you know, but as we wrap up, I'd like to ask you one very broad, simple question. Do you think that a Kurdish Alawite person can win this election? Is that doable? Is that Turkey's Obama moment? Uh, maybe if I can um, just briefly, um, you know, try to respond to the previous question, and which is related to this. I think it, uh, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu just making a, a terrible mistake of playing uh, uh, into Erdogan's hand by uh, talking about sending Syrians back to Syria uh, instead of talking about uh, Turkey's responsibility in, in creating the mess that is in, in Syria and, and trying to address what Turkey will do to, to uh, at least reduce its responsibility in the uh, tragedy in, in Syria. That will uh, basically solve the problem that he's talking about in, in a much more democratic and hum humane way, making Syria, helping Syria solve its problems in which Turkey has a very big responsibility that the international community is largely mm -hmm. unaware. On the second question, um, I think um, uh, the, the difference is, I think, when, when we make these comparisons is that Kılıçdaroğlu is Kurdish and Alevi, but publicly he do not own these identities and that's a very important detail like unlike obama who is you know a, you know african american and and he you know he owns that identity but in turkey uh this is just this is just being tolerated basically uh and he cannot uh, even erdogan was accusing him of not being able to say that he's from dersin he will prefer saying that he's from tunjeli so there is a lot going on there, and that is a very, uh, you know, people all know about this. But even if he is elected, he's not going to be elected as a Kurdish Alevi, but as an assimilated Kurds and Alevi. So that is uh, a very important dynamic in, in, in his uh, identity. But nevertheless, even if he is not owning those identities, uh, the Kurds and Alevis are largely... Um, in favor of him uh, as, as opposed to other possible candidates that the opposition might have put uh, to, to run against Erdogan. Thank you. Thank you all. Are you, Muge, are, are you, I, you're, the mic isn't working. Okay, well, um, I would rather have Hulia say something about this because uh, she does very important work on identities in general. Uh, thank you, Miguel. No, no, I was uh, fine with all of the explorations. I really uh, wouldn't. I mean, I was just going to caution that I really wouldn't compare uh, Kılıçdaroğlu to Turkey's Obama moment um, uh, for, for the reasons that Javad uh, so succinctly raised. Um, um, but uh, just wanted to sort of um, add a last sentence that we are hopeful about the elections, even though some of the candidates like Kılıçdaroğlu are uh, really not um, promising some of the ideals that we have set forth in this panel, including um, more uh, democratization and more human rights. Uh, already the Syrian refugee uh, proposition is um, uh, rather scandalous. Um, <laughs> um, and um, mind you, uh, Miguel mentioned this, um, during in the earthquake zones, uh, hundreds and thousands of Syrian refugees were uh, um, uh, impacted negatively by the earthquake. And um, there are a number of civil society organizations who are helping out. So uh, there is so much effort that goes into actually um, uh, sort of relief efforts based on uh, Syrian refugees and, and, and so on, that uh, it's a shame to be discussing at this stage um, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the opposition leader would rather have them sent uh, to Syria. So uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's really a betrayal of all the efforts that are going on right now to um, make um, um, this uh, sort of um, uh, catastrophe uh, struck zone uh, uh, a better place, a more amenable place for refugees. Um, so in that respect, I mean, I, I, I would harshly criticize that move, and uh, but I, I see why he's doing it, unfortunately. Thank you, Puya. Thank you, Muge. Thank you, Javad, um, for your insights, for this rich conversation. We'll be watching closely that election that's around the corner, and we'll all be in touch. Thank you for being with us, and thank 
all of you in the audience for joining us this afternoon.